Hello everybody, my name is Jeff Bees and I'm here to talk to you about some techniques that you can use with Excel for advanced linear regression and plotting. I will assume that you already have a basic understanding of statistics and the underlying principles behind linear regression and so on. And this is more about the procedural uh, application um, with Excel. So to start out, I have a sample data set here. And so my first step with uh, dealing with a data set like this is typically to convert the information that I've got into a table. And so in order to do that, you can click on anywhere within the table or in, within the region that you want to become a table. And then you can press Control T, which will pop up this menu option. And make sure that you have my table has headers selected. So once we have selected that, we just click OK. So once I've got this table, which you'll see the uses as I move along, uh, the next step that I will often do is I will get some workspace up here. And the way you can do that is highlight the uh, rows in which you want to move everything down. And this varies based upon the version of Excel. Uh, in my case, I can just press Control plus. Um, but the most common way that uh, different versions can do it is just press insert. And now what I'm going to do since I've got this large data set is I want to freeze the cells in place. And you've got a few options at your disposal. If you go to view and then go to freeze panes, you'll see you can uh, freeze the top row which would basically make this first row locked in place and you can scroll down while seeing that first row. Or you can do the same thing with the first column and hold on to this uh, time area. But in this case, we've got this workspace up here, and I want to keep time viewable at all times. And so I will actually do freeze panes, which whatever cell you have selected becomes the edge of the panes that you freeze. So if I select this now, now I can scroll down, and you can see that anything from row 16 up stays constant while the bottom part can actually scroll down and likewise if I scroll to the right the time stays in place. Alright so now the first thing that I'm gonna do here is go into what the equations are that we'll be using for the basis of our calculations. The error fraction here is equal to uh, an exponential function of negative t over tau and so since it, we've got an exponential function here, we can take the natural log of this item on the left in order to get a linear relationship between time, the time constant, and gamma, where uh, the slope will be negative 1 over tau. And when we do our linear regression, we want to do a plot with confidence bands, uh, which I will use the approximated simplification. So the first thing that we want to do here is calculate some constants. And so to calculate the maximum, uh, this one is just a max function, where since we have a table, we can select all of these temperatures really quickly just by hovering over the top of the table uh, header until we see this black arrow that shows up and then we can click on it. And you'll notice that we've got this uh, label of table 1 and then uh, temperature uh, in degrees Celsius and so this is a common format of being able to call upon uh, all the items within a particular table column. And so I could type this out as well and in fact uh, what I will do instead of typing this in is I will show you how to label this table uh, which can make this a little bit uh, easier process if you have multiple tables. So if you go to design you can label the table right here which I will just call uh, maybe temperature data. So then if I come over here I can say equals max and then start typing in temperature data and it recognizes that it's present so I just press tab and it'll finish off the label for me. I start out with a left square bracket and now it recognizes that I'm trying to call upon something from the table and in this case I want temperature so I'll come all the way down to temperature and press tab again and then close off those brackets with a, another square bracket and now it recognizes that I'm trying to highlight everything I close out the parentheses on the maximum function and now it calculates everything there. Ambient, I'm just going to go with a constant value of 23.5. 
and for a DT uh, you can eyeball this or you can precisely calculate uh, in case you wanted to turn this into a template where you had different time steps. So I'll just do the calculation version. The first thing that you want to do with the plotting is you want to see what you've got. And so I'm going to start out with just doing a scatter plot of this information. We'll deal with the formatting of these plots later, um, but we'll just use this more for instructional purposes. So we are not interested in anything in this heating period. We only care about this downward sloped region. And so that represents uh, some calculations that we need to do where we will remove everything to the left here and we want to start this maximum temperature point uh, at t equals zero, which means shifting all these values uh, over. The next step that I would take here is I actually want to label these values as variables. And in order to do that, there are a couple different ways you can do it. The first is to select the cell that you want to name, go up into the name box, select it, and then type in something like Tmax. And the reason why I want to do this is it allows me to reference cells by its name rather than the address like B1. So I will do the same thing with T ambient, but in a different way, just to show you how it works. And you can actually uh, define name up here. And this gives you a few more options than the way I did it just before. Uh, what we have is the, the name automatically is predicted based upon the cell that's just to the side of it because it recognizes that as a label. And it has a scope, which basically says, where does this cell name apply to? And if you're comfortable with this being for the full workbook, you can keep it as that. Um, but you can also have it labeled as an individual tab. And therefore, the calculations will only be valid with that reference on that tab. And that's valuable in case you have, for instance, multiple T ambients or multiple T maxes. Um, that reference will shift with uh, the tab that you're calculating on. And so in this case, I'll just leave it as workbook because that T ambient condition applied to all uh, the measurements here in future tabs as well. And so I'll click OK. And this one I'll just go with uh, DT. Once I have this, it'll make put plugging in these values a little bit easier. And so the two things that we're going to want to calculate next is the shifted time as well as the error fraction. And so I'll label these real quick. And if I want to adjust any of these uh, rows, I can actually go up to the region in between two different uh, columns, double click and it'll automatically resize to fit everything in. So in this case, the name plus this little filter icon, which I will talk about later. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do here is calculate the shifted time. And this will involve an if statement. I'm just gonna type out real quick and then explain what's happening. And so what I did here is I, the if statement basically states that if the value above the current value is in fact a number, then I want to take that number and add in that time step. So if this number were 0, for instance, the next number would be 0 0.1, and then the one after that, 0 0.2, and so on. But if it isn't a number, then we want to run a different if statement where we're saying if the current temperature is equal to Tmax, then we want to set this to a value of 0, therefore initiating that iteration of values. If it is not, if it has not reached Tmax and there isn't a number present, then we want to leave just a blank cell. So if I press enter, we notice that first it destroys this. Uh, and the reason why it does that is because uh, one of the downsides to using the tables is uh, it automatically wants to add everything you've put in here. Uh, and we want to get rid of that. And then if we scroll down, the maximum point of 104.6306 does in fact start out at zero with an iteration of point one, or with an incrementing of point 0.1, which is our goal. So the next thing that we want to do is calculate gamma, but only calculate it when the time is shifted to the proper value. And so in order to do that, I'm going to say if is number. So if this time over here is a number, then I want to run the calculation. Otherwise, I want to also leave a blank cell, just by the quotation marks. Close that out, press enter, and 
at that maximum point, we should see that gamma is showing up. Now it's a little bit bothersome to have to continually scroll down, and we actually don't care about anything before that temperature point, so we can actually use this filter button and remove all of the blank values. And further, we can shift this table over really quickly by moving this to T-shifted and then moving this into gamma. We want to start there. And now we have converted this over to error fraction versus time. Now we want to keep running through the calculations. All right, so for calculating the natural log of gamma, we want to be very careful to calculate only within the region of 0.1 to 0.9. And the reason why we do that is because the readings are not very good at the extremes um, due to ambient condition, boundary effects, and so on. So we need to find a way of calculating only within that range, which will involve another if statement. So again, I'm gonna fill in the equation and then I'm going to discuss what the equation means. All right, so this equation is kind of a nested if statement where the first thing that I'm checking is is the gamma value in between 0.1 and 0.9 and that's using an and statement where it's if it's greater than 0.1 and greater or and less than 0.9 next if that is true I want to do another if statement saying that if the gamma value is less than 0.5 and the value above the current value is a text value, which is what happens when you get the quotation marks, then I want to leave it as quotation marks. And the reason why I'm doing this statement here is because when you get into this region down below, uh, it will fluctuate back and forth between above 0.1 or less than 0.1, and that creates a discontinuity, uh, which will mess up your linear regression. And once we verify that it is not uh, going below 0.1 and then raising above it, uh, we want to put the resulting value as natural log of gamma. Uh, and then if it is not within this region, it also becomes a blank value. So if I click enter, and so if we look down this table, we see that the calculations start at around 0.9. And as you continue to move on down, once we get past 0.1, it will drop off, but you'll notice that it goes above 0.1 again, but these values don't show up, and that's because of this uh, second if statement. Uh, otherwise, we would have various values along the way, which would mess up our linear regression. Now that we have this in place, uh, we want to do the linear regression part using the linest function. And so in order to do that, you want to select a 2x5 uh, array and type in linest and you want to select the known y values. And so in order to do this more quickly, rather than having to scroll all the way down, I'm going to impose the filters that I was using before. So I'm going to select this filter. I'm going to scroll down, unselect blanks, and now the first value present will be specifically within the region that we're interested in. So again, I will highlight that 2 by 5 region and start uh, typing in the Linus function again. And I want to highlight the known y values. In order to do that, I will select the natural log and press Control shift down and select all the x's. And so the x's in this case is our t-shifted values, and then press comma. Since our equation up here will be just negative t over tau with no added part, we want to make sure that this intercept is forced to zero, no matter what it might calculate normally. And so we want to set this to false. And then we want to select true for return additional statistics. Then we close off. And since this is an array function, we have to press Control, Shift, Enter. And now we've got multiple values in here, which I will label real quick. The values that we're going to want to do something about is the slope here, which I will label. We also want the SEY value. And we want the degrees of freedom. Now we have what we need to do the calculation for the CI bands and the Y fit. So the y fit, since there's no intercept, is just m times the time shifted. Ci plus will be equal to this y fit value. 
plus the T value, which can be calculated using TI and V. 95% confidence interval, 1 minus 95% is 0 0.05, and then the degrees of freedom multiplied by the standard error of y, and divided by the square root of n, which in this case would be degrees of freedom plus 1. And in order to get the ci minus, uh, we just copy this over and paste it in here, and replace that plus with minus. And now we've done all our calculations for linear regression, now it's just up to plotting. So I'm going to clear out the natural log of gamma, so I get this whole plot. And I'm going to go into some steps in order to turn this default plot, which has rather bad formatting, and turn it into something that is a little bit more acceptable. Some of the steps that I'd start out with is for report's sake, uh, you actually don't want to have a title, and you do want to have axes labels. And so I'm going to go in here, click on axis titles, remove chart title, and then the next thing that I'm going to do is label. Now what we are going to do is remove this outer border. And so if you double click, you'll notice that this uh, format chart area uh, comes over here. And we can go to the border and say no line, which now you can see that that line has disappeared. And for some reason, the default uh, font and color is set small into gray. Uh, and let's say when you're doing the font, uh, set it to something like Times New Roman, and set this maybe to uh, maybe 11 point font, and make sure that this is black. Once you've done this, you can take this formatting and go over here to Format Painter, double click, and now anything you touch on this plot will match the formatting you just did here. So if I click on time, on the axes, click on Format Painter again to remove it. And now uh, what we want to do is create a border here that is black, and then move this size up to maybe 1.25. And you will notice if you look really closely that up here at the edge, this becomes slightly gray. And that's because by default, the line along the axis is also gray. And so I will change this formatting again to black. And now it looks a little bit more clear that it is black. And then we want this value down here, uh, these values to be at the bottom of the plot, not lined up with the axis. And so you'd want to go to Labels, Label Position, and set it to Low, which will force it all the ways to the bottom. And in our case, uh, what I'm going to do is force the axis to go down to zero, since we shouldn't be getting anything below zero, but sometimes it wants to have some extra space. So if you double click here, uh, go to Axis Options, uh, you can actually force the value to zero. Now you want to remove the grid lines uh, and replace it with tick marks. Now if you click on here and you want to add in tick marks, some people will go to the axis and go to tick marks and change the major type to inside and the minor type to inside, which is nice on the bottom, however on the top it doesn't show up. And we want to have these tick marks all around, so I'm going to remove these tick marks and I'm going to put in uh, tick marks that I can create using these grid lines. So the first step that I'm going to do here is go into the formatting and cr create a gradient line, uh, which through experimentation I know I need to shift this angle to zero. And I'm going to create a series of gradient stops of black, white, white, and black at various points. So in this case I'll do 2%. And you'll see what I'm trying to do here in just a moment. This will actually create the appearance of tick marks. I've seen other ways of trying to get this to work out, uh, and I haven't been satisfied with them because they use a lot of requirement for customization. 
and once we set this in place, usually this will work out just fine um, for a template's sake. So we see we've got some nice tick marks here, and we can do the same thing uh, with the vertical grid lines. Uh, in this case, gradient, I'm going to leave this as 90 degrees. I'm going to fill in the gradients without wasting time on the video. All right, and so the important difference that I made between the vertical and the horizontal is I chose 3% rather than 2% uh, for the vertical. And that's because of the uh, vertical size versus the horizontal size of the plot. Uh, this percentage is of the total length. And so since it is shorter, I need to have a higher percentage in order to accomplish the same tick size, or roughly the same tick size. And so now we've got some tick marks, um, but a lot of plots will include minor tick marks, which you can add those by coming over here to add chart elements and go to grid lines and add in uh, minor horizontal and vertical uh, grid lines. And then we can select these and do the same thing as we did before. This time I usually, when I do minor tick marks, I will reduce the percentage that I used for the major tick marks by 1%. All right, and now we see that I've added the tick marks in just by that slight reduction that I mentioned before. And now we can focus in on the data itself. And so by default, it comes in as these blue markers, um, which are a little large. And a lot of times you want to avoid color altogether. So I'm going to take the built-in uh, marker options and reduce the size. Depending on how many data points, you might want to adjust this size around. Uh, since I have a lot of data points, I'm going to keep this on a, a rather small end. And then I'm going to make this with a solid white fill and come over here and turn this into black. The nice thing about having this formatted the way you, it is, is you can actually save this as a template. And then you can actually use this uh, whenever you want to reproduce the same formatting. Now having done this, I can now plot the uh, linear regression uh, information. So again, I'm going to come back over here, click on blanks. So now I'm going to select the shifted time and the natural log of gamma and insert a scatter plot which starts out again with its default um, formatting. And we can go to change chart type, select templates, and scroll on down to example plot. And it looks like it's blank, uh, but that's just because when I set this, I had the axis options set to zero for its minimum. Uh, but I want to reset that because all the values are negative. And now I want to label these. And now what we want to do is add some information. So whenever you do a linear regression, you always want to have confidence bands. And we've done the calculations, so we can add both of these bands in very quickly um, just by selecting the T-shifted region. And we can copy this information, click on the plot, go to Paste and Paste Special. And then you want to make sure that this is set to New Series, Values Y in Columns, and then set the categories uh, for x values in the first column. So that's that time shifted. And click OK. Now we see the, them both pop up. And the other thing that I want to add in here is uh, linear regression. And so add in a trend line, go to More Options, and click into Trend Line Options. We want to uh, set the e display for equation r squared and set the intercept to 0 and move this default position over. And another thing about the trend line is uh, since we've got the confidence bands and we've got the data, uh, I actually usually remove that line altogether. And now I'm going to work on the formatting. Uh, but first, I'm going to label everything. Otherwise, it's a little difficult to uh, keep track of. And then I can select here and select Series 2, which is one of the confidence bands, in this case CI+, plus, based upon what it highlights. And I usually just label this as CI bands because I'm going to format both lines the same, and you can tell which one's the positive and which one's the negative just based upon relative position. 
And I want to remove these markers um, since these are continuous bands that we've calculated. So I'll set that to none, set it to red, make it dashed, and reduce the size a little bit. Now I'm going to move on to the, the series three. And we see that it's a really tight fit. Uh, if we want to make this a little bit more clear, we can reduce the marker size of your data just a little bit more. Um, but to a certain extent, it's just kind of bulky because of how many data points we've got. Um, but we do see that it shows up here. And now we want a legend. And so if we click on more options and go to legend options, we can show the legend with, with overlapping the chart, so unchecking this. Send it up to the top right and adjust the position here. And now since we've got uh, two bands that are the same label, the same look, I actually usually click on one of them and delete them from the legend. This linear regression thing pops up even if you don't have formatting. I'm going to delete that again and then move this up into the corner. And that's everything that I would do for the plotting here. And so for doing confidence bands, I would again save this as a template. And make sure you keep them in the templates charts section because that's where Excel will draw upon them. And so you can quickly reference them. And so now you can use this formatting again uh, for the next batch of CI bands that you might use. I hope that this has been useful for you. Uh, stay tuned for future videos um, because this is only a taste into various techniques that you can use for Excel to do some good calculations on a more advanced scale. I hope you have a wonderful day.